Let's take a look at Nikon's least expensive full-frame mirrorless camera, the Nikon Z5. But before we take much look at the camera, let's first take a look at some of the pictures I can make with this great little camera. This is Iron Christmas. <laughs> this is shot with the Z5, shot with my little Nikon SB400 flash, and the dinky little plastic kit lens, the Nikon Z 24 to 50 millimeters. This is shot at 24 millimeters at f10 at 1 200th of a second at auto ISO 100 minus two thirds of a stop exposure compensation. And it looks pretty sharp. All these images I'm going to show are still images captured with the Z5. And then I'm using my video editing software after the fact to zoom in on those images so you can see just how sharp they are. In other words, if I zoom in two, three, or four times, just imagine the entire print being two, three, or four times as big as your screen in every dimension. This, like all the current Nikons, make big, sharp, beautiful, colorful images. Here's a shot of a 1961 Corvette. Same Z5, same plastic 24 to 50 millimeter zoom, set to 50 millimeters at f11 at 1 50th of a second at auto ISO 200 again with my SB400 flash. And this is exactly as it was shot. And it looks pretty good. The reason I love using flash is because it may not be obvious, but I've lit up the front of the Corvette so it looks more like a flaming fireball, which otherwise would have been in shadow because the light from the setting sun is coming from behind us. Flash is very important. I wish this camera had a built-in flash, but it doesn't. Too bad. I use my SB400, which I got about 15 years ago, and it's still better than any new Nikon flash today because it's small, it recycles quickly, it's plenty bright, and you easily can get them if you follow the link to my review. Find them on eBay every day for about $100 each. This camera makes great images in low light, although as I'll cover, it's a pain to use in low light, like many mirrorless cameras. But given a tripod, this photograph here of Moonrise at Seven Palms Oasis is shot with, again, all these images are with the plastic 24 to 50 millimeter zoom. This is at 24 millimeters wide open at f4 for 30 seconds at ISO 125 with a 3200 Kelvin white balance. And it looks great. Again, I'm zooming in here with my video editing software to show you just how sharp it is. And it looks great you can see the moonlight glinting off the palm fronds. I mean, what could you better ask for <laughs> in terms of image quality? No concerns here. In the daylight, even with the colors turned very high, I shoot all these shots with the picture control set to vivid and saturation set to plus three to give me the screamingly vibrant colors that I imagine in my insane mind in my actual images. I never have to shoot raw or edit these afterwards in Photoshop <laughs> or anything because they come out of the camera exactly as I want them. That's important to me. I need to get pictures out and not just talk about it. So it's important that the pictures come out of the camera ready for use and don't require any fixing or, or raw twiddling. I don't have time for twiddling. I have to shoot. This is Desert Turquoise. Same plastic 24 to 50 millimeter lens, this time at 30 millimeters at f11 at 1 500th of a second. No flash. And this is exactly as it was shot. What I like is that even with the colors amped up at my insane saturation settings, Something difficult to reproduce, like this turquoise, which back in the days of film was very difficult to get it to look like it looked on Velvia, it looks exactly as it looked and exactly as I want it to render here on the Z5. This is Bougainvillea gone crazy. This is the 24 to 50 millimeters at the 31.5 millimeters at f9 at 1 320th of a second at auto ISO 100, no flash. And this, again, is exactly as it was shot. The shadows, the highlights, the colors, right as it came out of the camera. No need to fix anything like with crummy cameras or bad photographers. Here are twin arches. This is with the lens at 33 millimeters at f10 at 1 400th of a second at auto ISO 100. And that's some of the pictures it can make, which are absolutely as good as every other Nikon camera. Why I prefer this camera over the Z6 and Z7 and Z6 II and Z7 II is it has better controls. The picture quality is the same, but the key is with this, with one hand shooting, I can set it any way I want to. I don't need a lock on this, so I don't need a second hand to unlock the ring to turn it. And it's also on the correct side of the camera, which is here. It's not off on the wrong side of the camera requiring a second hand to try to fiddle with. I don't know about you, but I don't have a second hand available most of the time when I'm trying to get into crazy places and crazy angles to work this camera. So the fact that I can do this, 
That's paramount. Otherwise, the camera's pretty much the same as the Z6 and Z7. What is really good is much better than the Z6 and much better than the Z7. Autofocus on this Z5 works very well. It tracks well. The automatic all area AF mode works well and usually finds the correct area just fine. It doesn't lock on the background like the old Z7 and Z6 did. The good news is the Z6 II and the Z7 II have autofocus just as good as this. But if you're coming from the old Z7 or old Z6, this is a great step up because the autofocus actually works as it should. It's fast and it's smart. The camera also weighs less than the other cameras. It's not significantly made cheaper. There's a little bit more plastic, but so what? This is made out of plastic instead of being made out of metal as the other cameras, but it actually feels better because those metal rings <laughs> felt horrible on the other cameras. So this is my favorite camera, and yes, it costs the least. And guess what? I'm not a camera store. I could care less if you buy anything or not, so please. <laughs> just get the Z5 if you need to get a Nikon mirrorless full frame and forget the Z6 II and the Z7 II, which are just ways of Nikon to take more money away from you and bring that money back to Japan. Things for which the Z5 are not good, although the autofocus works well, it only runs at a rated four and a half frames per second. So if you want high frame rates for shooting sports, pass on this. In fact, pass on everything from Nikon and just upgrade straight to the Canon R6 or the Canon R5, each of which work at 20 frames per second, focus brilliantly fast. They are worlds ahead of anything from Nikon in terms of mirrorless. So please don't even waste your time with Nikon for mirrorless for sports or action. What's new since the old Z6 and Z7 is, most importantly... We have autofocus that actually works properly. We now have two card slots, and thank goodness, we have SD, normal SD card slots. Not those ridiculous XQD card slots. Also new is a much lower price. This sells about half of what the other cameras sold, and I prefer it. I covered that the mode dial is better. It now has people as well as animal eye and face detection. The older cameras only recognize those on people. So if you're photographing your pups or birds, it supposedly works pretty well. New is there's always a new battery every few years. This year's newest battery is the ENEL15 Charlie, which has just maybe 10% more capacity. And that's about the only difference. But you know, I'll take 10% extra. No complaints there. The battery life on this camera is actually pretty good. I never was able to run the battery down so unlike the beginning days of mirrorless with those awful Sony A7s that would get like, I don't know, 100 shots on a charge in actual use, who knows? This works quite well. This can be powered continuously, or so Nikon claims, with any USB-C PD power delivery rated charger, if you want. If you use a non-PD rated device, it will still certainly charge the battery. It just may take longer. And the key is it might not have enough power to keep the camera actually operating and the battery charged. And so you might run your battery down slowly using a lesser charger if you're actually trying to operate from that external source. But if you use a PD rated, power delivery rated charger, you should be able to run the camera at the same time and not run the battery down. Supposedly, Nikon has some software, which if you're using Windows, which I don't, you could use this camera as a webcam. I don't know why I would care. <laughs> you now have 20 up from 10 non-CPU lens data options. So if you go into this, if you're using old lenses, non-CPU lens data, you now have 20 possible lenses you can program in there. The sad thing is, this camera works crappy with Nikon's older lenses. With the FTZ adapter, it will not autofocus with any AF or AFD lens. You need at least an AFS lens to autofocus. There's no reading of the aperture ring, so it does not properly couple into the camera, the aperture settings. So the brightness in the finder doesn't couple properly. It's really horrible. If you want to use Nikon's manual focus AI and AIS lenses, don't use them on Nikon's mirrorless. You're much better off using them on Nikon's FX DSLRs, where everything actually works quite flawlessly. What's good is unbeaten Nikon image quality. It's got a low price. The viewfinder is super sharp and super bright. I can be out in the desert in broad daylight, and the finder is still brilliantly sharp and bright. I've never thought to myself, oh, it's a little too dim, as some of the earliest mirror cameras were. It also has a time exposure mode. For making long time exposures longer than 30 seconds, if we go into manual mode, among our many options is time. So when I press the shutter the first time, it's now open and exposing. And I can come back three hours later, or however long later I want to come back, press the shutter button again, the exposure's done. And what's nice is, when you play back your image, it's going to tell you how long it was. In this case, it was 10 seconds. And if it's, if it's 10 minutes, it'll read 600 seconds. It has in-camera image stabilization, rated five stops, although I've never found in-camera image stabilizers to work that well. 
It has built-in Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and Nikon claims some weather sealing. If we take a look around here, this little gasket here actually is rubber. Good luck. I don't shoot these cameras out in the rain. It's just marketing as far as I'm concerned. When I have shot out in the rain decades ago with unsealed mechanical single-lens reflex cameras, I never had a problem because if it gets too wet, I just shoot under an umbrella. So I don't worry about that. Weather sealing is just a marketing tool. What's bad? is the longest video length is still only rated to be half an hour long. You can't roll for longer than half an hour, which on my iPhone, I can run for as long as I want, and I never hit the end. Another minor bad thing is the software of the camera is improperly programmed so that this eye sensor here, which normally turns on the finder when you put your eye to it, as opposed to the screen when you're further back, is when you're carrying this around your neck and it's based around your body, it sees your body and confuses that with your eye. So it actually thinks you're actually shooting with your eye to the finder. It won't turn off the camera, which means you could be walking around for half an hour and the camera hasn't turned off for that half an hour. For whatever reason, my Z6, Z6 II, Z7s, all those cameras, they turn off properly when just held around your neck. They ignore that if you haven't pressed any buttons, they figure it's probably not you back there and turn off. So with this, I recommend that you turn it to the opposite position when you bring it from your eye. Although, to be honest, I don't always do that, and I've never had any problem with battery drain, so that's a minor point. Another thing that's bad is the menus and the finder data don't rotate when you rotate the camera. In other words, if I have the menus up, that's great if I'm horizontal, but if I'm on a tripod vertically, good luck. <laughs> if I'm on a tripod vertically and hit the menus, you've got to read them sideways. Same thing through the viewfinder. Better cameras, when you're actually looking through the finder, all this gobbledygook will rotate on the Fuji cameras and on the Canon cameras, not that I know of on Nikon. So you're trying to read sideways anytime you're shooting vertically. What's missing? There's no built-in flash. That's a big missing part because flash, as you've seen, is super important. When I showed you that first picture of the iron wreaths for Christmas, if I didn't have my flash on that camera, that wreath in the foreground would have been black. That would have been a boring, awful picture. The flash lit it up so it actually has some interest in the foreground. Flash is important, and you never know when you need it, so you always need to carry it. There's no automatic brightness control for the rear LCD. That's something sadly missing for most of these Japanese design cameras, except for some of my Canons. Let's face it, every iPhone has had automatic brightness control in their LCDs for over 10 years now. I don't know why the Japanese haven't gotten on board for this. The problem is it's difficult to do well. There's no 4x3 or 4x5 ideal format crops. It can do square crops, and that's about it. I have my camera programmed so that if I press the red button here, it actually controls the cropping. And I set that so I can get to the square crop. But the problem is I can get the square crop. I can get the DX crop or full frame crop. And also 16 by 9 crop. I don't know why you'd want that. But I don't have a 4x3 or 4x5 ideal format crop, which I find very handy. There's no time to manual exposures longer than 30 seconds. While I have a time exposure mode, I still have to get out my Apple Watch or iPhone and try to clock that out. I much prefer my Canons that have a bulb timer where I can just set them to say 2 hours, 15 minutes, and 27 seconds, and it will just go off and do that. I mean, come on. It's just firmware, but the Japanese camera makers would rather sell you a $35 or $135 remote release to do that. I think that's inexcusable today on modern cameras. There's no tally light during long exposures. When I make a long exposure, camera goes completely black. It seems a little bit weird, but think about it. If you actually shoot time exposures, as I do, and I have been doing for many, many decades, it's usually good to have at least one LED lit on the camera so I can be inside nice and warm and then when I see that LED extinguished from, say, 30 feet away, then I can come out and, and work with my camera. On this camera, there's no indication that it's exposing, so you have to guess. None of these buttons are illuminated. Use at night, you're basically in the dark. Well, you're completely in the dark at night. Yes, you can pull out another flashlight, but let's face it, every telephone I've had since the 1980s has had illuminated buttons, so there's no excuse for not having these buttons illuminated. Not that very few cameras at all have this, but they should. There's no option to set ISO in full stops, which again sounds like a silly little thing that I'm complaining about, but when I change ISOs manually, every click I want 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600. I don't want to go through the thirds. Are you kidding me? I don't want third stops. And the, most of the other cameras will allow you to set the ISOs in full stops as well as thirds. There's no ability to use a standard threaded cable release. Bluetooth is only 4.2, not 5.0. Does anyone even know what those differences are? No, unless you sit on those committees. And there's no built-in GPS. No problem. Lens compatibility? The only lenses with which it works properly are either the Z-mount lenses, which are native. If you use the FTZ adapter, it only works properly with AFS and AFP lenses and possibly AFI lenses, which are back from the 1990s. 
It will not autofocus with traditional AF screw focus lenses. Those are the lenses. There will be a little screw head on the back, and as you turn the focus ring, you'll see the screw head turn. This camera does not have a motor, and the FTZ does not have a motor because Nikon skipped that, so it will not autofocus with those lenses. And guess what? That means those work horribly on this camera. Nikon pretends that they're going to work properly to get you to stay in Nikon instead of upgrading to Canon, as you should. If you've got those older lenses, manual focus lenses, they don't work well on this camera. Forget about them and move straight to Canon. And I have a separate review about this plastic made in China lens, which actually takes remarkably good pictures, just that I don't know that I would ever pay $400 for this thing. However, if you get it as part of a kit, then it's much less expensive and it makes remarkable pictures and it does serve this camera well being so compact. This lens also collapses for carrying. So I don't like the price if bought separately, but by all means, get it with this camera if you're going to get this camera. The DXZ lenses, the Z50 waste most of this camera's sensor. I don't recommend those. There's also a Fringer adapter, which lets you use the good Canon EF lenses on the Nikon Z camera. And all of Canon lenses made since 1987 autofocus just great. It's really sad when you can get an adapter to make the Canon lenses work better on this camera than Nikon's FTZ works with Nikon's own lenses, which is another reason that I upgraded to the Canon system, and I love it compared to Nikon. You can adapt rangefinder lenses to this camera. Yes, you can go on eBay and get all the adapter rings you want to adapt pretty much anything to the Nikon Z mount. I even have a new adapter, which is made by Megadap, and I'll have a review coming up of that. And that adapter lets you autofocus with any manual focus lens. It has a motor built into the adapter, as Nikon should have done with the FTZ. But ultimately, it's ridiculous. To get the best results, just get the Nikon Z lenses or upgrade to Canon. Despite my whining, this camera is a winner. It's got great autofocus. It's got great ergonomics. It works very quietly. Something I skipped at the beginning was because the frame rates are slower, everything in this camera works a little slower, which means unless you're shooting sports for everything else, it's quieter. And because it's quieter, in my opinion, that's always better. You annoy people and animals less. You can get what you want. The Finder is a standout. It's brilliant. It's sharp. It's super bright in daylight and doesn't even have to strain to do it. It has superb high ISOs and technical image quality all at a really low price. The only things it doesn't do is shoot at high frame rates, and it doesn't work well in pitch black. Here's a problem. For low light shots like this, this is a great looking shot. But what I didn't tell you at the beginning is, is to get the camera to focus, it wouldn't focus a darn. This is actually looking through the optics of the electronic viewfinder. This is what I saw, total garbage. If I pressed the shutter button halfway, to let it try to autofocus, then it would slow its frame rate down and at that super slow rate eventually successively approximate, try to get in focus with the cleaner images at longer, longer exposures at slower frame rates, but it was painful. And on top of that, it couldn't focus in the dark light. It couldn't focus with the crappy little green obnoxious LED autofocus light. I had to get out a 900 lumen German made super flashlight out of my pocket, light up the scene with the super flashlight, let it autofocus, then change the camera to manual focus to lock that exposure and then make the picture you see here. The finder is horrible in low light. Most mirrorless cameras have awful finders in low light. If most of what you want to do is low light, don't even use mirrorless. Use a single lens reflex camera because you can still see what you're doing. Manual focus is really good. Presuming you have enough light, the boxes through the finder turn from red to green when you actually get in focus manually. And also at the lower left hand of the finder, there's a little indicator that shows two arrows and a central dot for in focus. So manual focus works really well. You can also get focus peaking as well as lots of magnification. Auto ISO is up to modern standards. Ergonomically, as I said, it is really good. Some flaws still are the play and trash buttons are on the wrong side of the camera. And the reason why, if you actually have to shoot every day for a living, is I'm used to just using this one hand to control everything on my good cameras. On this camera, its defect is to get it to play back, I have to reach over here. I could pre-program some of these buttons possibly to do that, although I prefer to use this one for cropping, but that's the way it is. Admittedly, that's not all that bad. These flaps are crummy. In the studio shots in my written review, you'll notice half my pictures are taken with these not even fully pushed on. Why? Because it's really difficult to get to any of these connectors here. You've got to pull these flaps off, which are just simulated rubber. They're going to fall off. You see this is the only thing that holds them on. And in 5, 10 years, that's going to fall off, and you're going to lose these. And you say, oh, I won't lose them. I'll push them on really carefully. No, you're going to lose them. And the problem is to get them to stay on properly after you've made a connection there, you're not going to take the time to do that, so expect them always to be half off. Flash works great. The flash sync speed is a 200th. The flash bolt in the viewfinder is orange. Let's look at high ISO performance, which is excellent as all 
of the full frame mirrorless cameras have been since they came out. These are full images. And the good news is it looks the same at most of the ISOs. And that's paramount. What's important is you can shoot at any ISO you want. And when you're looking at complete images here at reasonable sizes, I don't know what size your screen is at home. The key is everything looks pretty much the same from one ISO to the next. It's only as we get to the really high ISOs that the first thing I see at a rational size is at around 25,600 is there's some modeling. On the fireplace, you'll see some slight magenta and green blobs. It's not that bad. It's not grainy. It does get a little bit softer, but that's not visible at these sizes. 51,200, a little more model, a little bit more grainy. Even at 102,400, which is called H or push one, it's grainy. But at this size, it doesn't look that bad. If you needed to use this in some ultra low light setting, by all means, use this as opposed to getting a blurry picture from motion. The difference is if you want a really sharp picture and your subject isn't moving, go on a tripod. Here are 10 times magnifications. These are crops out of the first images I just showed you. These are 600 by 450 pixel crops. Now, ISO 50 is the sharpest but it also has a higher highlight contrast, which usually helps the sharpness. But if you have a difficult lighting, you might lose your highlights just a little bit. But at each successive ISO, you lose a little bit more sharpness. It's not that you have more noise. What happens is the noise reduction is, is scrubbing away the sharpness and small details. At the same time, it's scrubbing away the noise. As we get up here to say ISO 1600, you'll notice the fine details between the numbers on the clock face, those are just blurs now. 3,200, they're almost completely gone. At 12,800, the fine, the fine lines are gone, and the minute marks are starting to get erased by the noise reduction. 25,600, most everything on the clock face is history. At 51,000, almost everything, including, <laughs> including the hour ticks, are missing as well. And at ISO 102,400, Almost everything's gone, and it's pretty noisy. It's, it's pretty nasty. Let's look now at the same size crops, but from the same images down where the fireplace grate was. At the lowest ISO, ISO 50, you get the most amount of detail, especially here in the shadows. If you look at the screen on the fireplace grate, it's very well resolved, and you can see the bricks behind. Even at ISO 100, it's a little bit less sharp. And at each successively higher ISO, the screen starts to go away a little bit. In other words, the shadow details are less. And as we are going up here, you'll notice the marks of the bricks behind are also starting to disappear. By ISO 1600, there's no more bricks behind the fireplace. It's just gone. Again, the noise reduction gets rid of what it thinks it can to get rid of the noise and takes some of the picture with it. ISO 3200 has almost got no detail at all except for the large curly cues. At 12,800, barely the curly cues are there. 25,600, the curly cues themselves are almost missing. 51,200 and 102,400, the curly cues are pretty much lost in the noise. So the takeaway is use whatever you want at normal magnifications at normal image sizes. However, if you're going to make a large enlargement looking for details, remember resolution goes out the window at higher ISOs. You want to lock down on a tripod, shoot everything at F8, expose for as long as it needs to to shoot at F8 at ISO 100 or ISO 50 if you demand the sharpest possible results. Like my shot of the Seven Palms Oasis was again at ISO 100 on a tripod, and I used F4 30 seconds for this shot because I didn't want to wait around 5 or 10 minutes for it to expose elsewise. For automatic lens corrections, you have your choice of vignette control, which is the edge darkening. That, like all Nikons recently, can go high, medium, low, or off. I leave it at normal, which is the default. Diffraction compensation, which is for trying to get a little bit more sharpness at really small apertures, I leave it on. The reason auto distortion control seems grayed out is with some lenses, like this little dinky plastic lens here, it always corrects for distortion. It won't let you turn the distortion correction off, which tells us that this lens would have a lot of distortion if it wasn't corrected. Mechanically, it's par for the course for modern camera. What's metal are the strap lugs and these little rings. The top cover, the central viewfinder tower cover is metal. The hot shoe, of course. The LCD hinges, meaning these pieces, that's metal. The lens mount and its lock pin. This is the lens mount. This is the lock pin. That's metal. 
The car door pivot. The car door is plastic, but the pivot is metal. The small pattern on the tripod socket. This is metal, but this is all plastic. And the tripod socket itself is metal. Everything else is plastic, which people accept today. This mode dial, all the buttons, all the dials, all the switches, all the levers, all the knobs, all the nubbins, they're all plastic. The rear section of the viewfinder, this is plastic. The car door, this whole rear cover assembly here, that's plastic. The frame on the LCD and its cover is plastic. This is not glass. This bottom cover here, this car door for the battery is plastic, and the battery door is plastic. And this actually is designed to pop off. People freak out. <laughs> I do workshops and people freak out. These doors pop right off. This way it doesn't break or bend, which could happen and really make a day bad day. It will pop off and it won't be damaged. So you can pop it back on. So if your door pops off and you're out shooting in the woods, pick this off, spit on it, clean it off. Pop it. I'm kidding about spitting on it. And close back up and you should be good to go. What's rubberized is the eye cup, the grip materials, and these crappy little connector covers. The serial number is hidden on the sticker on the back of the camera. This is offshore to Thailand, which they put on the sticker back here. I could not find a date code. There's a little bit of clunking when you shake this. I believe that is the free play in the sensor, which is used to be able to move the sensor around. Rear LCD is no news as far as Nikon goes. You can tilt it up about 120 degrees or 90 degrees, tilt it down 45. It doesn't go side to side, which means if you're on a tripod like this, or if you're shooting vertically, then you can't really move it around a whole lot. That's what it does. Data, the cards are correctly formatted as Nikon Z5. JPEGs are tagged as 300 dots per inch. Like every digital camera or 99% of all digital cameras, the vertical image are simply flagged as vertical. They're not actually pixely rotated at vertical. What's bad is, is an 82 kilobyte junk file called nc underscore flst.dat in every image folder, which means if you're used to, like me, just grabbing the contents of the folder and dragging them into your finder, no, you've now got these junk files. Shame on Nikon. Those should be somewhere else. What is nice is you can save the entire camera state and then recall it. So if I send this out for service or I share on my written review on my website, kenrockwell.com, I actually share my settings file so you can get the same settings I use. You get to those at the bottom of the setup menu where it says save load menu settings. This will save most things about the camera. Unfortunately, it is defective in design because what it forgets is, is it doesn't recall your my menu menu. What is good, it saves almost all the menu settings that you set in the camera. It does save all your copyright information, which takes forever to enter. Every time I get a new camera, I have to copyright. Copyright, kenrockwell.com, my phone number and everything else. It does recall that. That's good. But it doesn't recall your My Menu menu. So in other words, I have my My Menu menu programmed, and all the settings in there are now gone when I recall from that card. Too bad, so said. For charging, you can use any USB-C cord. No problem. If you want to use USB-C PD, power delivery, that's fine. It might charge a little faster, but I just charge overnight. And they're all good for me. I use a card I got at the 99 cent store, plug into any generic five volt USB and I'm good. You also can use the external charger. I don't bother to do that because it's more disassembly. It's very nice of Nikon to have included an external charger with this camera because it is unnecessary and it is an inexpensive camera. If you have two batteries, which you don't need because I haven't been able to run a battery down in a day, but then when you get back from your job at the end of the day, you can charge one battery in your camera through USB and the second battery you can charge in the separate plug-in external charger, which is included with the camera. For AC adapters, use a USB-C PD power delivery plugged in there and it should work just fine. Another great thing is clock accuracy. Call me picky, but hey, I've been doing this for so long, I see these subtle points, is most cameras vary by about 15 seconds a month, which means as the months roll on and I shoot with multiple cameras on the same job, I can no longer sort by time so I can get all the different angles that I've shot of the same thing on different cameras all sorted at the same place. So I wind up having to reset my clocks on my cameras every so often. You probably can set this to set to GPS if you use the app. I don't have the time to fiddle with the app. The great news is this camera hasn't gained or lost anything in the several weeks that I've been shooting with it. That is extraordinary. But that's just it. That's not this camera. That is this sample of camera. Every sample of camera will be different, but mine is extremely good. If we compare it to the Z6 Mark II, the only real difference is the Z6 Mark II has inferior handling because the mode dial is off on the wrong side and requires a second finger to unlock the mode dial. That's a pain. When you actually shoot as opposed to just talk about it, that is a pain. The Z6 Mark II runs at a much higher frame rate, and that's nice if you're trying to shoot action. 
Both have surprisingly good autofocus. The Z6 II also has time for exposures as long as 15 minutes. That is a big advantage, and it does work better at night. So if you're shooting a lot at night, which very few people do, that's another reason to get the Z6 Mark II. Ultimately, the technical quality of the pictures seems to be identical. My Z6 Mark II properly shuts off when it should, carried around my neck. I can set the Z6 Mark II ISOs and full stops. So those are minor things. If you shoot every day for a living, honestly, I still prefer the Z5 because why? This mode dial is important to me. The smaller things on the Z6 Mark II are less so. But on the other hand, if those things are important to you, just get it. Versus Canon, oh, I so prefer Canon for so many things. All the little things I complain about on these cameras don't happen in Canon. And also Canon makes some pro-level cameras. The R6 and R5 go up to 20 frames per second with great resolution and everything. So all the little things... Stick with Canon. Canon has a much better line of lenses. For the same price on Canon, instead of this crappy Chinese-made plastic, they have a 24 to 105 with a metal mount that's made in a free independent country. So <laughs> by all means, Canon is the way to go. Versus Sony, I hate Sony. Back in 2013, they're the only game in town for this kind of electronic viewfinder mirrorless camera. Sony cameras, we haven't heard anything out of them in 2020 so far because no one really cares ever since Canon has come so far ahead. Sony cameras are difficult to hold. The ergonomics are poor. On this camera, although it doesn't look that way, when you actually hold it, you'll notice, for instance, this is canted at about a 37-degree angle. So when your finger goes across it, your finger's also at a 37-degree angle. It feels good. The Sony cameras, for the most part, have very hard edges. These edges are not that hard. They're radius just so slightly. They're not knife edges like on Sony. Sony cameras are hard, and they're sharp, and they're not comfortable. Everything is curved and moved around to where our fingers naturally feel them. The buttons I can identify by feel. And also the pictures look so much better on Nikon. Sony cameras, when set to vivid, don't give me the vivid colors that I prefer out of my Nikon camera set to vivid. So good riddance to Sony. Versus Fuji, Fuji doesn't even make a full-frame mirrorless camera, so who cares? If you want my personal settings file for the files that you can save and recall, you can get those at my written review at KenRockwell.com. And that's it. This is a great camera. This is by far my favorite Nikon full-frame mirrorless camera. I would prefer to shoot Canon, if you ask. But to be honest, this camera doesn't cost that much. If you think that you have an old stable of Nikon lenses that are AF or AFD, and you're going to get good use out of them or manual focus lenses, no. Skip it. <laughs> Skip it and just go straight up to Canon. But on the other hand, if you're just starting out, this is a great camera for what it is. So thank you again for watching Ken Rockwell and KenRockwell.com. If you'd like to support what I do, of course, you can subscribe. But my biggest support is, is if you're going to get anything, and I don't think you necessarily need to buy new cameras, but if you do, if you use the links in my description to the recommended sources that I use myself, I got this camera from B&H, and I've been getting my cameras from B&H since the 1970s. For over 40 years, I've been their customer. They've always treated me right. So use the links in my description to get any of this stuff. And that's what keeps me on the air. And I really, really, really appreciate all your support for the past 20 or more years that I've been on the air at KenRockwell.com and now here at KenRockwell.tv. 